welcome everybody to this uh, panel discussion of the uh, Louisiana Historical Association during its 2021 annual meeting. Of course, it's a Zoom meeting, a virtual meeting this year. And tonight we'll be pre presenting uh, the legacy of the colonial German Acadian coast. Kind of just want to remind everybody, this is uh, 2021, it's the 300th anniversary of the arrival of the first Germans to our coast. And for many of you who aren't familiar with Louisiana, you may be thinking we're talking about the Gulf Coast, but actually we're talking about the Mississippi River. And uh, it's historically been known as the coast, probably because when they didn't have levees, we had annual flooding and it might have kind of seemed like a coast, but I just point out the area that we're talking about. It's an area that's just below Baton Rouge, Louisiana, going all the way to just above New Orleans, Louisiana. And it's really actually five areas. Um, the first two areas were settled by the Germans starting in the 1720s. And that was an area in St. Charles Parish uh, that they first settled. And then uh, a second wave of Germans came in and settled in St. John the Baptist Parish, just above that, uh, centered around Laplace, Louisiana. And then in the 1760s, we had a group of Acadians come in in uh, 1766 and settled in St. James and the lower part of Ascension Parish. And then finally in uh, 1767, they settled in uh, the Upper Ascension in Iberville Parish. So that'd be the second German coast and then coming down is the, I mean, the second Acadian coast, uh, first Acadian coast, second German coast and the first German coast. So that's the area, area that we'll be discussing tonight. I'm Martin Guidry. I currently live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana and I'm originally from a small Acadian hamlet of Abbeville, Louisiana in South Vermilion Parish. Uh, I'm not a historian, I'm an inorganic chemist by trade, but I have a heritage of being Acadian and a little bit of German in me too, from the Toops and Shakespeare side. And uh, since 1970, I've been researching my family and doing presentations on that and on Acadian history and culture. And I'm quite honored to uh, chair this session of the Louisiana Historical Association's annual meeting. Just a couple housekeeping tips. Please uh, keep your mute buttons muted so that we don't hear your local conversations. Uh, if you want to show yourself, click the, uh, the, mute, the uh, video button, which is on the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you don't want to show yourself, then exit out and it'll just show your name. You'll also see a chat button down there. Feel free to use that to write any comments you want to write and also to put any questions you may want our presenters to uh, answer later. And we'll try to get to some of those. To uh, night, we uh, let's see. There we go. Tonight we're going to have three excellent talks, and you can see them there. Uh, Dr. Andreas Hubner is going to speak on uh, it's a German sausage with a French name uh, about the uh, Côte des Allemands at 300, a critical assessment. Then uh, Dr. Francis Cobb Turnbull will be talking about natives on the German and Acadian coast a window into the native imperial politics in Spanish Louisiana. A uh, topic we don't see written a lot about or talked a lot about is the natives in this area of uh, Louisiana. And finally, uh, Fernan Eaton is gonna be talking about the Acadian petitions, a 300 year legacy, another area that you don't see a lot written in detail about. And finally, the commentary will offer, be offered by uh, Jay Shakespeare. And I'll just introduce Dr. Hubner at this time. Uh, Dr. Hubner joins us from uh, a little distance away from Louisiana, down in uh, Lindeberg, uh, Germany, where I think it's probably about midnight now, something on that order. So he's staying up late. Uh, I will say that he does have a Louisiana connection that I'll mention in a minute. I believe uh, uh, Lindeberg, Germany is connected with uh, Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the name of it comes from that area of Germany. Uh, with the town there and uh, some of our original foreign Protestants that settled Lunenburg in 1753 came from that part of Germany. Dr. Hubner is the project coordinator at uh, Lafonia University and uh, he's in the Destination Abroad program, a student and faculty exchange program in their Institute of English Studies. Since 2013, he's had various positions at a number of universities within uh, Germany and uh, it's currently, as I said, in Lithuania University as a tenured professor or a select, excuse me, a tenured senior lecturer 
in didactics and North American studies. Uh, he uh, studied at Tulane University for a short while, which is just uh, above, the, uh, just below the uh, German coast there near New Orleans in the field of American studies. And he got his doctoral degree from Justice League University in Gießen. He's published several articles on the Germans of Louisiana and has participated in a number of conferences, workshops, and summer school. Received a number of honors, including the Dr. Herbert Stolzenberg Award for Excellence in Higher Education Teaching, and also the Diane Woost Fellowship in the Arts and Humanities in 2016 from the Historic New Orleans Collection. So you see a couple of uh, Louisiana connections that he has, and uh, I'll let him talk about a little sausage with a French name. Dr. Hubner. Thank you. Thank you for your kind introduction, Martin. And um, thank you, Fernand, for organizing this panel. And uh, James, for your technical support. And thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. Um, slides should be up, so I'm just going to start right ahead. One second. OK. It's a German sausage with a French name. The Côte des Amants at 300, a critical reassessment. Asked to describe his Anadouille sausage, Jared Zeringer, proprietor of a traditional butcher shop and restaurant in La Place Louisiana, most recently replied, quote, it's a German sausage with a French name, unquote. Immediately adding that, quote, around here, that just makes sense, unquote. Given the fact that La Place is located in the area now referred to as the German coast, Zeringer's statement comes as no surprise. Residents of the river parishes often reference their colonial history and ancestry when asked to explain certain elements of their culture and background. Zeringer's comment about his Anadouille sausage is but one example. French, Spanish, and German roots are commonly remembered as people discuss the history of present day practices of cooking, musical performance, architectural design, etc. And uh, Marty already showed us where the German coast is. This picture here is, let's say, um, a relict of the early arrival of the Germans, so German speaking migrants in New Biloxi, colonial New Biloxi. Um, this picture here, this card here from the Archive National du Tremer, is a card which also places the, the German coast, so to say, during colonial times. Right here, um, the village Allemand. Uh, 12 leagues up from New Orleans. So this is the, the towns or the, the space I'm going to talk about here in the following. In contrast to, to these rather popular remembrances in the past years, historians of all periods and fields have explored the colonial history of Louisiana and challenged longstanding narratives and practices of remembrance that privileged French, Spanish, and German contributions and that place the African and the indigenous share of the story at the margin. Historians now employ approaches such as entangled history that center on the interconnectedness of people, commodities, ideas in Louisiana's long past. One such entanglement may have taken the form of the Anadouille sausage, like Boudin and Tasso, as historians Marcel Bienvenu, Carl and Ryan Brousseau have remarked, quote, Andouille is a product of cultural borrowing. German immigrants brought rich sausage making traditions to Louisiana during the 1720s, as the German population was assimilated into the predominantly French-speaking population, so was the art of sausage production, unquote. German-speaking migrants, of course, also assimilated into the African and native populations that surrounded them. Enslaved Africans would live and cook on their grounds. Members of the Pitti nations prepared and sold foodstuffs in the larger New Orleans area. Typically spicy, the German coast variety of Anadouille may easily have borrowed some of its special flavor from West African, Caribbean, and Native American cuisine and be considered a part of what historian Ibrahim Asek considered to be a global Indian, Mediterranean, and Atlantic food-based network. Now, taking these observations as a starting point, I will A, briefly assess the historiography of the German coast and delineate, delineate mass narratives that have presented German-speaking settlers in French colonial Louisiana as hardworking and industrious. I will be then re-examine the early settlement of the German coast and provide a re-reading 
of early reports and serious records. And I will then close C with a suggestion to reconsider memory cultures and practices in the German coast area. Hence this, papers, hence, this paper raises questions about contemporary perspectives on past historiographies and argues for a critical approach to the history of early French colonial Louisiana. Drawing from source arrived materials that are mainly housed in the Archive National de Tremere in Aix en Provence, I argue that German speaking settlers were more entangled with the African, Native American, and French neighbors than the field pietistic tradition of German American studies has usually allowed. In Louisiana historiography, to date, early studies by field pietistic historians of German American provenance are very influential. Beginning in the late 19th century, Fiopistic scholars, among them J. Hannah Dyler, explored the contributions of immigrants to Louisiana history and highlighted the accomplishments of individuals, individual journals. In terms of narrative, few pietistic scholars opted for migrant stories that started from an initial point of suffering to result in a steady ascent towards a success. Such success stories, of course, were not unheard of in American history. And given the example of the New England Puritans, constituted an integral part of the American dream. In his seminar, The Settlement of the German Coast of Louisiana and the Creoles of German descent, Hanno Deiler, in concluding, cited the ancestors of the German speaking migrants as follows We are the descendants of those Germans who turned the wilderness into a paradise, such as Louisiana never possessed before. The influence of Dyla's work is not to be underestimated. His research continues to reverberate in the studies of social historians such as John Now, Reinhard Conrad, Helmut Blume, and Ellen C. Merrill. These scholars in part revived narratives on the one hand that on the one hand emphasized the contributions of German-speaking immigrants and on the other hand propagated their successful assimilation and acculturation into the French-speaking population. Reflecting upon the status of German-speaking migrants during the Spanish colonial period, Ellen C. Merrill commented, quote, through the decades, the farmers of the German coast maintained the mentality of the original pioneers. The orientation was toward farming for their own needs and finding profit in trade with the capital. Just as in the French period, the German coast continued to serve as the bread basket of the colony. Both men and women were considered very desirable marriage partners. The males were known for their dedication to hard work and devotion to duty. The women were considered diligent housewives and healthy, prolific mothers." Unquote. Now, in recent times, with Adam Rothman's slave country in 2005, the 1811 German Coast Slave Rebellion has received much scholarly attention, and narratives about successful and hardworking settlers are slowly being challenged. Historians now emphasize the agency of enslaved Africans and other marginalized groups. In combination with spatial reconsiderations, scholars, instead of examining the history of the German coast exclusively within the framework of Louisiana, have incorporated circum-Caribbean, South American, and African spaces and actor into their analyses and arguments. With Cécile Vidal, Nathalie Dessons, Jean-Pierre Le Gourmet, Historians linked to the French colonial history have made fundamental contributions, presenting historical change as a product of transfer, mobility, and movement. Until today, unfortunately, very little research exists that brings these different strands, that is the theopietistic narratives and entangled histories into dialogue. And I believe that such a dialogue would really help to historicize early reports that frame German-speaking migrants as hardworking and industrious. So let's have a brief look at these, um, at these very early census records. And here's, I think, the first one that, that mentions the so-called Germans or the German-speaking migrants. It's a census of November 1721 that is often attributed to Durand d'Artaguet. And he first portrayed, portrayed the migrants on the German coast as hardworking and as industrious. And the translation here is by Ibrahim Anze. The German families, numbering about 330 persons of all sexes and ages, are placed 12 leagues above New Orleans, 
on the left bank side ascending the river. On very good land where there were formerly Indian fields easy to cultivate. These Germans are divided into three boroughs on a terrain of great extent that never that has never been flooded. As these people are very industrious, it is expected that a harvest will be abundant this year and that in the course of time, they will succeed in making good establishments in the colony. And here's the original document. Um, traveling through Louisiana territory on behalf of the Company of the Indies, Swiss mercenary Coli passed by the German coast in May 1724 and reproduced Durand's description. He wrote, quote, 10 leagues below, below by Bayagula, 50 to 60 German families are established, mostly men and women. Few of them have children, although this nation is very hardworking, they have not received any slaves. They can do nothing but live on substance farm, unquote. Durand and Collis' words set the tone for the years to come. Whenever travelers or census takers described the German coast, the phrasing was more or less repeated. In this, by the 1720s, the German coast reflected general tendencies of colonial societies and governance and the offered model for future aspirations. When documenting the number of migrants and of enslaved Africans, and when describing their living conditions and work ethic, colonial officers and travelers were never simply just filling in their journals and census records, but they were envisioning the future of the colony, a future that was to be built on large scale plantations and cash crops and on small scale, scale habitations that would nourish the colony. The German speaking migrants appeared ideal prospects for such imagined futures because they differed from earlier forced migrants substantially in three ways. First, to start with, most migrants had begun their journeys as part of a community project. And for them, the colonial expedition had become a sort of a family endeavor. Thus, the migrants had raised hopes among colonial officers that they could contribute to the growth of the population. They were not only to provide the basis for a densely populated settlement, but their offspring was to constitute potential marriage partner for future generations of French colonial men. Unlike in the case of the French or Swiss soldiers and the coureurs de bois, rumors about the German-speaking migrants, about German-speaking migrants entering relations with Native Americans or even African women never circulated. Colonial officials therefore trusted that the families could promote the social stability and the racial purity of the territory. Second, the migrants who were originally introduced to the colony as indentured servants had volunteered to move across the Atlantic Ocean. As such, again, unlike so-called French criminals and vagabonds, the settlers of the German coast were trained professionals ready to prove their productivity. Among them, an early census listed blacksmiths, bakers, coopers, hunters, butchers, millers, tailors, shoemakers, weavers, and carpenters, such as the ancestors of the Zerian family. 23 settlers were labeled as laborer, that is as agricultural workers or small farmers, who in the French colonies were noted, quote, for their industriousness, were a vital cog in late ancien regime agriculture, unquote. Over the years, such descriptions of laborers and bon travailleurs as industrious became powerful societal forms and norms that would be reinforced discursively time and again. Now, thirdly, the German-speaking migrants differed from earlier forced migrants in the sense that they seemed to correspond to a new and modern time of the industrious person. The migrants were assessed as hardworking in the midst of a transformation of the transatlantic discourse on industriousness. By the beginning of enlightenment, the concept of industriousness had acquired an alternative set of values that redefined the qualities of work. Industriousness was no longer understood in terms of attentiveness, skillfulness, diligence, or eagerness, but it was now associated with planning, perseverance, and purposefulness. The control of these factors was incumbent on the common co community. The size of the harvest made industriousness measurable and accessible. In the eye of the expert, only through planning and perseverance and purposefulness could a successful harvest be achieved. Statements about industrial settlers were moreover strongly connected to common linguistic images and formulas as used by Durand d'Artaguet. These images and formulas reinforced and solidified 
a discourse in which German-speaking settlers took on a life of their own as industrious settlers. Historian Rudolf Schender has captured this process. Labeling, pe labeling people as industrious, he suggests, quote, ultimately included the use of plausible linguistic images and formulas that did not fail to have an effect through constant repetition, unquote. Such constant discourse repetition, of course, is still highly influential in stories and narratives about the German coast. And such repetition, of course, excludes oftentimes Africans and enslaved Africans on the German coast. So let's look on this side of the story. Appeals that ask for the introduction of slavery on the German coast can be found from the very beginning of the settlement. These appeals need to be understood in the context of colonial society making and governments governance in an entangled Atlantic world. Enslaved Africans would not only strengthen the workforce, but they also presented a source of knowledge. And as the call for help from an early census taker illustrated, they ultimately secured the survival of the settlement. Quote, if these German families who remain of the great number which have passed here are not held by slaves, they will perish bit by bit, unquote. In other words, enslaved Africans were not a reward for industrial settlers, but they guaranteed that settlers survived and that they could be described as industrials in the future. The interconnectedness of African enslaved Africans and the success of the German coast is evident in the census records of the colonial period. Take, for example, the famous census of 1724, and I just cited from that census, and all my uh, translations are from Albert Robichaud, of course. Herein, 13 settlers were appraised as bon travailleurs, while it is clear that in the future they would depend on the workforce and the knowledge of enslaved Africans. Jean-Adam Matern, for example, a native of Rosenheim, Alsace, born, in Cath born a Catholic Roman and a weaver by trade, was labeled a good worker, who married some slaves, unquote, by a census taker Perry. Matern was documented to live together with his wife, an infant child, two sisters-in-law. He farmed a habitation of two and a half arpins and owned three pigs, had cleared most of his land and harvested 17 to 18 barrels of both rice and corn. Neither rice nor corn, of course, would have been on his family's menu back in Europe, let alone how much Matern might have known about cultivating these crops. In contrast, enslaved slaves, enslaved Africans, constituted a body of agricultural professionals, skill and experience in the cultivation of these crops, and those crops that were crucial to the survival of the German coast. Foremost, of course, of rice or African rice, it was probably found uh, in Louisiana via the, Bay, via the West Indies. Enslaved Africans knew how to grow, for example, Providence rice, that is small scale home use rice with little or no artificial irrigation and river rice that is of course irrigated rice along the Mississippi River. So um, looking at time, we, we need to, to close up here and it's clear that until today, of course, um, early settlers are remembered as industrious and hardworking while other historians, historical agents are oftentimes forgotten to the point that one might call or talk of a German coast aphasia, a form of occlusion of knowledge about other groups, just as Africans and Native Americans, especially if we talk about the success of the settlement. Yet the success of the settlement and the colony, of course, was highly dependent on these enslaved Africans and on frontier exchange between Native American groups and colonial subjects. This knowledge should result in inclusive memory cultures and practices the past of the German coast should be written as an entangled history of interaction closely tied to the Atlantic world. Memory cultures and practices should be adapted accordingly. Historical markers, for example, could be redesigned in ways that include African and Native American contributions and to come full circle, the history of food and food ways on the German coast could be reviewed to include references to African and Native American origins and traditions. This said, of course, I'm not an expert in the making of sausages, but maybe there's more to an anadouille than a French name and a German heritage. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Hubner. We appreciate that. Very good. Our next speaker will be Dr. Francis Cobb Turnbell. And uh, Dr. Turnbell comes to us from Nashville, Tennessee. She received her bachelor's in history from Texas A&M University and her master's and doctorate from Vanderbilt University with her doctorate coming in 2014. Throughout her college career and into today, she's focused on Acadian settlement and immigration and on Spanish Louisiana. Dr. Turnbull, excuse me, Dr. Turnbell has been an instructor at several universities in Tennessee and Kentucky in the field of American history. Currently, she's an adjunct instructor at the University of North Alabama, and she's editor of the Tennessee Historical Quarterly. She's written extensively and presented at professional conferences on various aspects of Spanish Louisiana and the German coast. Dr. Turnbell received the Newberry Consortium on American Indian Studies Graduate Student Fellowship and the David Library of the American Revolution Fellowship, as well as other recognitions. Dr. Turnbell will speak now on the natives of the German and Acadian coast. Thanks, Marty. Um, so today I'll be exploring um, the experience of uh, native populations on the German and Acadian coasts as really a window into understanding um, the experience of native peoples in Spanish Louisiana. Uh, the Spanish period itself is easily divided in two. Um, the first half, 1763 to 1783, the years that followed the Seven Years' War through the American Revolution and then 1783 to approximately 1800. This periodization is important in a particular way for native peoples in Louisiana, uh, and in a particular way, uh, specifically for those living uh, and traversing the German and Acadian coasts. From 1763 to 1783, the Mississippi acted as an international boundary between British and Spanish North America, a situation that offered some political opportunity to Native peoples. Following the American Revolution, the international boundary, or rather the dispute over it, was removed eastward, depriving Indians of the lower river of significant political power. And so that's the dynamic we're going to see unfold here. The close of the Seven Years' War signaled a season of migration for many small population groups throughout North America. In the lower Mississippi, Petite Nation uh, Indians were among those groups actively migrating as they took refuge from Britain's assumption of power east of Louisiana. Indeed, peoples such as the Pascagoulas, Appalachies, Tensaw, Mobilians, Biloxis, Alabama, and Pecanias migrated westward at nearly the same moment that the Acadian exiles sought refuge in Louisiana during the 1760s. Many migrating groups situated themselves initially along the Mississippi and near New Orleans. On the Acadian coast, they would come into contact and experience both competition and conflict with one another and with other native groups already living there, particularly the Humas. The migration of native peoples and the Acadians increased the population in Lower Louisiana at a critical moment for those peoples themselves and for the colony. Um, as they settled uh, in Louisiana, Petite Nation continued to survive, especially through their participation in the frontier exchange economy that knit them so closely to local communities. They joined the Humas and the Chittimachas acting as hunters and laborers, trading fish, game, and surplus crops. Most of the smaller Indian groups looked westward and migrated in this way out of their predisposition against Britain um, after decades as enemies of the Chickasaws. In 1763, news of Pontiac's rebellion contributed to general Indian hostility towards the British as even as far as the Gulf Coast. In 1763, Choctaws and a coalition made up of Tunicas, Afagulas, Chittimachas, and Humas prevented 400 British troops from ascending uh, to the Illinois country. In, sh in the short term, they succeeded in driving the British convoy back down the river. Another, the smaller coalition of Indians, consisting primarily of Humas and Pecanias, delayed the construction of Fort Butte 
1765 with attacks at the British there. The first Spanish governor of Louisiana, Antonio de Ulloa, reached the colony in 1766 and set about crafting a defense strategy specific to shaping Louisiana as a border colony. In doing so, he rightfully acknowledged that Indian allies were perhaps the most significant factor to colonial defense. Amassing Indian allies along the Mississippi was meant to work hand in hand with expanding settlement in the area. Encroachment by colonists and by other native groups was a real threat that the Humas living on the Acadian coast faced. A fine example um, of the distance between policy such as Uyoa's and practice in Indian relations can be seen in this area with regard to the Humas, the Alabama, and the Tensaw, who resided all together on the Acadian coast in the 1760s. The competition between Spain and Britain for Indian loyalty in the region rendered relations between colonists and Indians increasingly tense. Meanwhile, Humas and Tensaw became concerned that expansion of Acadian settlement would jeopardize their own villages and ultimately displace them. The recent migration of Alabama to lands near the Humas also may have made the group more sensitive to this issue of encroachment. Meanwhile, the Acadians did not live quite as quaintly alongside native groups as Spanish officials had perhaps anticipated. In February 1767, commandants Veray and Judis requested cannons to signal to their colonists the arrival of Indian conflict. Further, they complained of acts of banditry as well as access to alcohol granted to natives along the coast by British traders at Manchat. But in November, it was the Tensaw's turn to complain. Distressed at Veray's use of cannon fire, they expressed their concern to the governor who beseeched Veray to tell the colonists, quote, not to harass them in any way, and on the contrary, to be well disposed towards them. Signaling the significance of native peoples to the Spanish empire, O'Reilly made a point to engage them in native ceremony during his brief time in Louisiana. Indeed, the ceremony of September 30th, 1769, in which representatives and chiefs of the Tensaw, Pacanas, Humas, Afgulas, Bayugulas, Tunicas, and others participated, included music, song, and fanfare at the governor's residence, where an elaborate ceremony unfolded, in which the chiefs set their weapons at O'Reilly's feet, and the governor smoked the symbolic pipe with them. These chiefs returned to their villages bearing Spanish medals on red ribbon. Similar ceremonies were repeated that fall for the many groups living south of the Arkansas post. As the 1770s dawned, native groups on the lower river recognized that the political situation favored them. In 1772, a Tensa chief and a Mobilian chief migrated along the lower river, each holding British and Spanish medals. That same year, Alabama and Tensaw settled at various moments in British territory and at others in Spanish territory. In fact, during the era of partition, seeking to maintain their independence and stability of their communities, many of these smaller Indian groups took advantage of the opportunity to cross the imperial border as a means to negotiate simultaneously with Spanish and British representatives. Because colonial representatives sought out exclusive alliances with petite nation chiefs on behalf of their respective empires, these groups, though small, were able to negotiate from a place of power. Imperial representatives often competed with one another on native terms, according to Indian custom and ceremony. As they traversed the international boundary with ease, petite nation sought to placate both sides, to receive gifts from both sides, and thus to locate themselves in relative security, friends of both Britain and Spain. After promising loyalty to Spain, a Pacanya chief noted that he understood peace between the Spanish and the British to mean that he could take the hand of each. The Alabama sang the calumet to official Charles de Scudreau at Spanish Manchac, just after stopping at British Manchac to receive gifts. The Creek Choctaw War contributed to tensions on the lower Mississippi also prompting frequent Indian relocation. Throughout 1772 and 1773, rumors of Tallapoosa attacks on the Mississippi River, Mississippi River communities frightened Indians, officials, and co colonists alike. 
The Tensaw awaited a raid in August 1772 after the Tallapoosas claimed that one of their chiefs had been killed at the Tensaw village. The Tallapoosas did in fact attack the Tensaw village uh, at that point near Manchac. They had relocated numerous times, killing the chief. The Tensaw and the British settlers living at Manchac made haste to Spanish territory where they received protection. By February 1773, Tensaw's Picanas and Alabama had tired of life near Manchac as wartime threats escalated. After petitioning Governor Inzaga, they settled that, op that spring in Opelousas. That same year, another group of Alabama were included in the annual census at Rapid. And so we'll see a migration um, along that Red River. Meanwhile, rather than fleeing the border, Huma's on the Acadian coast and at Lafouche prepared for conflict. Those at Lafouche built a palisade for self-defense. The threat of attack in the summer of 1773 never did materialize, but that winter, the Humas collaborated with Choctaws in a plan to attack the Telepooses. Thus, Indians operating along the Mississippi chose different paths to manage the threats posed by the Creek Choctaw War. Migration remained a strategy for survival among these groups. Interestingly, threat of involvement in Indian conflict, the Creek Choctaw War in this case, not the competing European empires, most contributed to the decision of some groups to settle further west and extend greater loyalty to Spain. At the close of August 1779, these same native allies of Spain prepared for war. As Spain had hoped, Louisiana colonists and native peoples willingly took up arms on behalf of the empire when war broke out with Britain. When Galvez left New Orleans, the troops he assembled represented a multilingual, multi-ethnic, local and imperial force. Equally diverse militia and Indian allies met up with them over the course of the 11 day march to Manchac, including 160 Indian allies and 600 militia from the German and Acadian coasts. The re the re these 160 Indian allies included 100 Humas as well as Alabama and Picanas. They remained with Galvez over the course of the Mississippi campaign and like their neighbors, they remained on alert over the course of the war to defend the colony, which was important as imperial interest focused further eastward towards West Florida. In 1781, in the wake of the Natchez Rebellion, those same native warriors, along with the militia of Louisiana, uh, worked together to suppress a real crisis in their neighborhood um, and um, went to Natchez to do so in June. Without a doubt, Spain's Indian allies rallied to the cause of empire during the revolution and ultimately to their own defense as well. Through their participation, um, they should have, have won certain um, rights and rewards, although those were not usually, um, those promises were not usually met uh, as, as they had been made. However, the close of the war marked a shift in fortunes for the smaller Indian groups living in lower Louisiana. As Spain turned its interest to expanding settler population, plantation economy, and the slave population, Indians in lower Louisiana became increasingly marginalized. Although Petit Nation Indians strove to sustain uh, connections with colonial settlements and the colonial government uh, and to sustain adaptive practices so key to their survival, appreciation for the integration of these groups in the lower Mississippi was dissipating rapidly among officials at New Orleans. In spite of the Indian loyalty that had been displayed during the revolution, Spain fell short of its promises to reward Indian leaders. Leaders used Spanish failure to fulfill promises in their own negotiations, repeatedly requesting payment of their reward and reminding officials repeatedly of their service. In 1782, Lloyd Ducarp, a chief of the Alabama and Durnaville, a representative of the Pacanas, traveled from Opelousas to New Orleans to seek the presents due them from the Baton Rouge campaign. In 1788, Actayati, then chief of the Alabama, has still sought recompense for his role in suppressing the Natchez Rebellion. These groups were not alone. They were really representative of the overall native experience following the war. Still, officials continued to turn to Indians to assist them in tracking down Maroons and attempting to eliminate Maroon communities following the American Revolution, a project of priority for officials during the 1780s. 
Such was the case on the German coast in 1782, when an itinerant maroon community dogged officials and preyed upon the livestock of colonists. In 1785, at neighboring Lafouche, Judis turned to his Huma allies, in addition to his militia, in his attempt to eradicate the maroons moving about his district. And in the end, it was the Humas who killed the maroon leader and dispersed the band. In instances such as these, Petit Nation especially attempted to leverage their role as slave catchers and their intimate knowledge of Louisiana's waterways and topography to remind officials of their value to the colony. In 1784, Tascaya Tabe, a chief of the Picanhas, died at the home of colonist Alexandre Chenet on the German coast. At the local level, the relationships between Indians and colonists remained personal. During the 1780s, numerous Indian peoples in Louisiana suffered crises of leadership such as this. These crises reflected shifting alliances among groups as they tried to navigate the changing world of the lower Mississippi. The Picanhas experienced frequent turnover in leadership. After Faspusi chief since 1782, excuse me, 1780, died in 1782, instead of a new chief, the Picanha selected the representative named Durnville to work with the Alabama chief. Though still living, he was later replaced by Tascayatabe, who served as leader of his people for only a short time. Pascagoulas, Appalachies, Biloxis, Atacapa, and other native people faced similar crises of leadership during the 1780s and 1790s. In 1793, the Humas, still living on the Acadian coast and at Lafouche, experienced conflict among their villages. The Huma chief, Mingos Cuyo, also known as Jacob, then with 10 men and some women visited Judice at Lafouche. They sought his mediation with the village of the chief, Natsiabe. Judice presented the situation to Carondelet when he sent Jacob to New Orleans to meet the governor. Judice noted that Natsiabe had received gifts for the Humas for four years, but had failed to distribute them properly to the rest of the villages. But Carondelet, interested in perhaps other goings on at the, that moment in 1793, informed Judice that he sent Jacob and his party home without gifts, without attention. In spite of post-war neglect, Petit Nation cooperated with colonial militia, and continued to travel to New Orleans for traditional meetings with the governor and to obtain medals and approval for new leaders. In doing so, they tried to maintain their long-held alliances with settlements and with colonial government. All the while, colonial officials seemed largely indifferent to these once indispensable groups. The Spanish colonial era was one of quickly shifting fortunes, frequent migration, and need for adaptation among native peoples. Their efforts to adapt to the changing society around them persisted for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Turnbell. We appreciate you presenting here. Our next uh, presentation will be by uh, Fernan Eaton. Fernan's from St. Francisville, Louisiana, which is uh, just north of uh, Baton Rouge. He's an attorney at law with a strong interest in lower Louisiana history. After earning his undergraduate degree in journalism at Louisiana State University, he worked for a period with the New Orleans State's item newspaper in New Orleans. He then returned to LSU and completed his Juris Doctorate at the LSU Law Center. For the past 38 years, Fernan has worked as an attorney with the Louisiana Department of Health. In his avocational field of lower Louisiana history, Fernan has written and pre presented extensively in numerous areas of the field. In 2019, he presented at the Louisiana State Bar Association's program at the University of Moncton in Moncton, New Brunswick. The title of his talk was Où allons-nous à partir d'ici? Mr. Perrin's petition, the next 40 years. For those of y'all that might have trouble a little bit with French, that means where do we go from here? Mr. Perrin's petition, the next 40 years. The thing that interests me is how do I get to Moncton to do a presentation when I'm with the Louisiana State Bar Association? That's pretty good. Uh, this evening, he'll speak on the Acadians' use of petitions. Mr. Eaton? Uh, thank you, Marty, and thanks to all who are participating today, and special thanks to the LHA and James uh, for keeping us uh, 
technologically up to date. And to our conference chair, Shannon, Dr. Shannon uh, Fristak, and to my fellow panelists. The cover of Naomi Griffith's great work, The Acadian's Creation of a People, shows uh, one of the dilemmas within the Acadian historiography. Her publisher's answer to that dilemma was to airbrush out the sedan, which appears on an interior page, but keep it out of the cover. Today, I'd like to offer three points while I go through the 300 years of the petitions are that first, there are tools that are now available that will allow scholars to search the metadata of the Acadian petitions. Second, that the search uh, reveals that the Acadians were politically astute manipulators of the levers of law, history, and philosophy, and using only a goose feather for 40 years, they were able to keep at bay the world's greatest superpower up in their homeland of Acadie, which the British, after they claimed it, called Nova Scotia. And third, the Acadians continued use of those same levers after their 1764 arrival in Louisiana is a legacy to the entire nation as well as to our state. And first, I am not an historian nor an Acadian, and about all I knew about Acadians uh, were that they came here after being expelled. So you can imagine my surprise to find Dr. Cobb's footnote 46 in her article two years ago that the Acadians had used petitions as their preferred interaction with the new British overseers in Nova Scotia. Their use of the petitions allowed them to remain on their land to continue with their French language and with their French religion, and primarily one of the biggest concerns they had, not to have to take up arms against their native uh, uh, First Nations uh, neighbors, the Mi'kmaq, with whom many Acadians had families. This led me to perhaps the most noted of all Acadian petitions, that by which Lafayette attorney Warren Perrin sought an apology from the Queen, resulting in the 2003 Royal Proclamation, which did acknowledge wrongs against the Acadians. But I get ahead of the story. Trent Andrews, in his 1988 book, took on two myths about Acadians, one being Evangeline's, Longfellow's Evangeline myth, the other being caricatures of Acadians as being a bit short on intelligence, who never made it out of the 18th century. I'd like us actually to spend some time in the 18th century toward the end of this presentation, but first let's get through the 20th and 21st. Governor Edwards called it one of his legacies of which he was most proud, the 1974 Constitution's provision that the right of the people to preserve, foster, and promote their respective historic, linguistic, and cultural or, or origins is recognized. The Acadians in Louisiana had worked diligently to have that clause inserted. Immediately following that success, Acadians had the legislature pass a parent's right to petition schools to require French language instruction. Parents won their court petition against their local school board who would not honor their original petition to the board. Last year, parents in a different school board district won an injunction against that board, which also tried to limit the parents' right to petition. Acadian success is also evident in last month's report that France and Louisiana renewed the Franco-Louisiana Accords for recruitment of French teachers and curricular support from France. In 1980, an Acadian won a federal court ruling that discrimination based on Acadian national origin violates Title VII. So now we leave the 20th and 21st centuries having seen Acadian success ensconcing the constitutional protection of cultural and language rights, a legislative act providing the right to petition for language instruction, two successful court cases affirming that right, plus the accords which will have run for more than half a century, plus the federal ruling against national origin discrimination and Mr. Perran's successful 1990 petition 
to the queen. Now we briefly go to the 19th century where we shift the vocabulary as to the meaning of petition. What we've discussed so far are just those petitions that are filed in a courtroom. We move now to the petitions which are addressed to the sovereign, whether that be the king or to Congress. Our US Constitution provides for the right to petition in Article I, which the Founding Fathers saw, excuse me, that's the uh, Bill of Rights Amendment I, which the Founding Fathers saw as emanating from the Magna Carta. Louisiana French in 1803, including Acadians who had been here for half a century, were stunned to learn that France sold them to President Thomas Jefferson. Two weeks after accepting the transfer from France, newly arrived territorial governor, William Claiborne disparaged locals in his January 2nd, 1804 letter to James Madison saying, quote, principles of a popular government are utterly beyond their comprehension, close quote. And a week later, quote, the more I become acquainted with the inhabitants of this province, the more I am convinced of their unfitness for a representative government, close quote. Yet at the same time, Claiborne and his fellow commissioner, Governor, excuse me, General James Wilkinson, each wrote their superiors in Washington that these same, quote, unfit French inhabitants were very well versed in international law and that these inhabitants had actually cited Emmerich de Vattel and his current law of nations. Wilkinson said, quote, there are those here who are not unacquainted with Vattel's 24th chapter, and if they possessed the power, they would not hesitate to employ it for the assertion of their independence. That reference to Vattel's Law of Nations provides that a treaty, such as the one between Thomas Jefferson and Napoleon, binds none but the contracting parties, and thus provided the Louisiana French with the legal right to resist American rule under international law. The French immediately invoked the right to file a petition with Congress. There are uh, clips here of two. The first one at the top coming from the territory of Orleans, uh, and it is a remonstrance of the people of Louisiana against the political system adopted by Congress for them, and referred to it as a memorial of their rights, a remonstrance against certain laws which contravened them and a petition for that redress to which the laws of nature have entitled us. French inhabitants of St. Louis lodged a similar petition. Uh, what had happened, Congress had split the Louisiana Purchase in two. We currently in Louisiana live in what was then called the territory of Orleans, more or less, and everything above was called the District of Louisiana with the headquarters at St. Louis, which of course had a very large uh, French population, not only Canadian French, Acadian French, and Louisiana French. The remonstrance was not only local news. Newspapers up and down the eastern seaboard reported its progress. Uh, they even issued special editions to report the entirety of the remonstrance. The remonstrance succeeded. It denied Jefferson's attempt to impose English as Louisiana's one official language forced him to appoint French-speaking officials and assured full representative government in Louisiana. But can I say Acadians contributed to writing the remonstrance? Not yet. The way that awaits work by genealogists and others to research the scores of names of those who signed. Three years later though, in 1807, Acadians, and I thank Marty for this, Acadians were uh, among the scores of individuals, dozens of individuals petitioning Spain's king for help leaving American rule in their effort to relocate to areas still controlled as part of New Spain. Petitions were not only used by Acadians and other French inhabitants. Louisiana's indigenous peoples, as early as 1790, petitioned Spanish officials to obtain their freedom invoking O'Reilly's 1769 decree prohibiting enslavement of Indians. 
Two eminent scholars, Julian Vernet and George Dargo, attribute the 1804 remonstrance to Edward Livingston. I argue that this fails to address the fact that by the time Livingston arrived in Louisiana in early 1804, at least one memorial was already in the works. More importantly, that assessment by those scholars seems to assume that also the French inhabitants were incapable of drafting their own remonstrance without outside help. Further, documents from 18th century Louisiana show that the French inhabitants clearly had sufficient grounding in international law, history, and politics to have come up with the 1804 remonstrance without outside help. In two documents of 1768, a memorial and a separate manifesto, French inhabitants objected to newly arrived Spanish rule. In, seven, in 1990, researcher Charles O'Neill provided an exhaustive analysis of both concepts as well as specific names which the manifesto writers listed, revealing highly sophisticated philosophical and legal thought of the most influential theorists of their times, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Pufendorf, Emmerich Vattel. The manifesto, O'Neill says, quote, maintains that the age old French law has indeed forbidden the sovereign to alienate a part of his realm, close quote. Dr. Cobb's 2018 piece on the 1768 revolt is one of two I've encountered which break from a prevailing narrative of Acadians as passive pawns manipulated by urban elites in 1768. Samuel Biagetti, whom Dr. Cobb cites, holds that, quote, Acadians emerged from the rebellion as victors, close quote. I suggest that while each shed welcome light on Acadian agency, further research will reveal the manifestos and the memorials intellectual debt to the Acadian petitions as recently as 13 years earlier against British in Acadie. Carl Brasso's quest for the promised land includes many important documents related to the Acadians prior to and after arrival in Louisiana, including many petitions in the mid 1700s. Also, Jean-Francois Mouhot's Book, the Acadian Refugees in France mentions several petitions from Acadians while in France after their expulsion. Naomi Griffiths describes the resilience and adaptability of the Acadians petitioning process nuanced as to where they were in time and place. She mentions petitions originating with every destination, efforts to resettle them in Guyana, Corsica, the Caribbean, the Falklands, Belle Ile en Mer in France, South Carolina, and Philadelphia. And you might ask, how is it that I could ascribe political, philosophical, and historical acumen to a people so frequently described as illiterate and intellectually deficient or simple and ignorant? My answer begins with the burgeoning field of literacy studies and the interrogation of concepts related to pre-literacy. The First Nations relatives of the Acadians, including the Mi'kmaq, have established a great, greater beachhead in the literature challenging, challenging settler-based impositions of literacy yardsticks. Criticized by Professor Birgit Rasmussen recently as recording a monologue rather than a dialogue in a quote, clash between different cultures of literacy, close quote. Indigenous groups challenge treaty interpretations and assert rights to harvest all manner of natural resources today. The record of Acadian investment in this research as to their own alleged illiteracy has not kept pace. As one scholar says, non-native historians are only beginning to recognize the value of indigenous knowledge and ways of learning, referring to the two row wampum belt, which was a portrayal of a 1613 treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch. And there's considerable controversy as to whether it, it is or is not representative of that treaty. 
If we put aside our own cultural bias, we see that the European rulers, in this case, Henry III of England, in gifting this belt to his colleague Ferdinand in Spain, had distributed large quantities of belts, which I actually see as wampum. They, they serve a very similar purpose to what the First Nations and other indigenous on the North American continent uh, used wampum for. Henry did this as evidence of his treaty relationships. Rhetoric professor Angela Haas suggests that we look at wampum the same way that we look at computer code. Just as digital coding indicate, dictates the visual rhetoric of Western hypertext, so too does the digital coding of wampum hypertext, according to Professor Haas. Acadian petitions against the British started immediately after the treaties, and there were many treaties of Utrecht, not, single, not a single treaty in 1713. While Acadians were described as illiterate and ignorant, there were hundreds of books at Fortress Lewisburg, which here is pictures I took a few years ago, uh, and it, they are curated to the year 1744. So that would be 11 years prior to the expulsion. That doesn't say that the Acadians had access to, uh, to these documents, but there was uh, considerable foot traffic and intercourse with the folks at Fort Louisburg. These are but a few of the examples that are available online of uh, the trend of the, uh, if you will, the British transcriptions of minutes of their meetings with the Acadians. Uh, from 1720, it references the petitions. This other one uh, from 1721 is the, talks about the petitions of the French inhabitants. Uh, the petitions went for a period just over 41 years. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, a word is not a crystal, transparent and unchanged. It is the skin of a living thought and may vary in color and content according to the circumstances at the time which it is used. I suggest that the concepts of these international thinkers, albeit not their verbatim texts, are refracted in the Akkadian petitions. I've listed some of the uh, leading theorists, international law theorists at the time, the U.S. Uh, in our founding fathers, we quoted John Locke uh, exhaustively in our founding uh, correspondence. Uh, Thomas Hobbes at the bottom, less so. Uh, Samuel, Samuel Pufendorf to a little bit. Uh, there was much about Emmerich Vattel. He still appears in our uh, Supreme Court rulings uh, to this day. Uh, and it awaits further research to look at the Acadian petitions to tease out the concepts, even though they admittedly do not mention these folks by name. The, I go back to this uh, ground penetrating radar, which was used uh, between 2017 and 2019 to see what was hidden pretty much in plain view until the technology came along and uncovered these uh, uh, significant numbers of burials at Grand Pre historic site there in Nova Scotia. Tools today that we can use would include the open access plagiarism software and other text analysis to see beneath the skin of the Acadian's words to find patterns and maybe even suggested authorship of the pre and post expulsion petitions, especially those of 1768 and 1804 Louisiana. Until then, each of us can form our own image of Evangeline. These uh, are representative of a recent art contest uh, hosted by Grand Pre. And true to what Carl Resto observed, among some Acadians, the quote, the Evangeline story was and is a deserving target of humor and even ridicule. Not everyone may agree, but I think these are a wonderful, vibrant way to introduce inquiry to younger minds as to what an Acadian heritage, identity, and legacy mean today. This, however, is my Evangeline. Uh, this is the one that due to the British failures against the Acadians in Acadie, uh, prompted the British to 
enact the Royal Proclamation as well as the 70, 1774 Quebec Act, which uh, scholars have said that pretty much prompted the American Revolution and uh, led to the first North American decolonization. Uh, the Acadians also participated in the 1768 Manifesto against Spanish rule, as well as the 1804 Remonstrance against Jefferson. And then you have Warren Perrin's uh, magnificent piece in 1990, which led to the recognition uh, that wrongs had been done against the Acadians, and who knows where that might go. The, that is not a bad legacy for 300 years, and I'd like to segue to two scholars, very important scholars to the LHA that we lost in the, just in the last uh, few months, couple of months. Uh, James Dorman and Judith, Judith uh, Gentry had each co-authored a mod what they called a modest proposal nearly 40 years ago uh, in response to the ongoing threat to history curricula at all levels of instruction. We need to find a way to reach these people. And we may begin by listening and analyzing the reasons that they give for their understanding of history. But while we're doing that, we'd like to give thanks and comfort in the fact that some folks already appreciate our efforts. To them and to you for participating today, a big thank you. And that's the end. Thank you, Fernand. I appreciate that, and all of us do. I'll uh, mention again that if you have any questions for the speakers, please put them in the chat box, and we should have some time to answer some of those uh, after the commentary. I want to introduce uh, Jay Shakespeare. Jay earned his Bachelor of Science degree from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He initially began his working career in software applications and systems analysis arena but his love of Louisiana history overtook him. In 2001, he began working as a guide at Laura Plantation in Bashery, Louisiana. And shortly after, in 2004, he became the operations manager for Laura Plantation. For those of you who may not know about Laura Plantation, it's one of the most authentic in time at plantations along the Mississippi River that you can visit. The tour guides tell you the real life story of the occupants and the field workers at Laura Plantation. Jay is a current president of the German Acadian Coast Historical and Genealogical Society, and he's a two-time past president of the Genealogical Research Society of New Orleans. And he also serves on the board and as a member of several other historical and genealogical societies. He's very well respected in the genealogical and historical circles of the lower Mississippi Valley. And tonight, Jay will offer commentary on tonight's presentations. Jay? Thank you, Marty. Um, <clears throat> it's a very fitting that uh, this year's um, presentations are about the German coast in particular, because it is our tricentennial year, as Marty mentioned earlier, from our, our founding in 1721. As the president of the society, we've been looking forward to this year for several years, and we were open to plan lots of activities, but unfortunately having a global pandemic, it's not conducive to having a big fair type of uh, festival situation. So unfortunately we will have to postpone some of those things. But one thing we're doing right now is we're selling yard signs uh, where people can order from our society's website, uh, basically a sign that you might see like politicians put up during the elections but they're the same size. And you can put your German Coast family surname in your yard to let everybody know that you're a descendant of the German Coast. So that's one thing we're doing. And we are planning a trip in September to Europe to visit our ancestral homeland, which has been planned for two or three years now. And hopefully uh, everybody in Europe can get their act together and get vaccinated. So they'll let our, our borders open up <laughs> so we can go there. But if not, the trip will be uh, postponed to next year. Um, as a genealogist uh, listening to these presentations, I always listen for the genealogical slant. Um, all genealogists are historians, not all historians are genealogists. But um, I saw that uh, through, the, through the, all of these papers, we talked about uh, integration, and it was the integration of the Europeans, both with the African and the indigenous people of North America, 
that led to the success of their survival on, the, on this new world. And the Acadians, of course, it's well known in, in, in Canada that their integration with the Mi'kmaq people uh, was very crucial to their survival. However, in Louisiana, it seems as though um, not, there was not such an integration. Um, however, the people who are of homeless Indian descent today um, all have French blood, most of which have Acadian blood in them. There is no pure Homa Indian in Louisiana uh, today. And um, I read uh, during the pandemic or the quarantine of last year, a book called um, Wild Frenchmen and Frenchified Indians by Sophie White. And she analyzed the upper Louisiana area, what is Missouri and Illinois country. And um, she identified through material culture how those people there, were uh, the, the French colonists in that area were much more integrated than the people in lower Louisiana, who apparently did not, um, did, did not necessarily rely so much on the Native Americans for survival, but more so on the Africans. And so in Dr. Hubner's uh, paper, um, one thing that he mentioned was that, you know, we need to re reevaluate how we, we analyze the history of such places as the German coast because of the African contributions. And uh, a few other things I noted in his paper was the emphasis, he emphasized the Germanic as opposed to Germans, because I often correct people that Germans did not come to Louisiana because Germany did not exist in 1721. The people were Germanic that spoke the uh, Germanic languages, but the, the German coast was very diverse and people are surprised to know there was as many French people on the German coast there was the, the Touche family, which came from Prague, uh, Czech, which is today Czech Republic, or Czechia, as they want to be called. Um, the Schecksneiders, we think, were from the area of Belgium or Holland. My DNA test, I'm been corresponding with these people. I think our family came from the Limburg area, which is kind of like where all the borders of Europe come together. Um, they were from Bayern, Baden, Württemberg, Switzerland. So the people were not ethnically or homogenous from one little small area and all migrated. They came from a vast and broad area and were speaking a variety of dialects. So the German coast was a lot more cosmopolitan, I believe, than people seem to, to believe. So to integrate with the Africans and Native Americans that are, uh, were here as well, uh, the German coast was, uh, was a little bit different. So. Um, also, you know, Dyler's book, while it has many, uh, does provide us insight from 110, 115 years ago, there is so much wrong in that book. There is a lot wrong. And he was such a, uh, a, a fan of, of German uh, history and culture, um, he, he kind of tooted his horn a little bit too much. But a lot of the information, particularly the genealogical information, is so wrong he started the myth of the six Schneider brothers that came and therefore started the Sheck Schneider family, which is complete fabrication. So uh, when people reference Dyler, although it may be still referenced, uh, do, your, do your homework because there's a lot of misinformation in there. And um, also one thing that um, the German coast, um, what happened on the German coast was uh, interracial uh, relationships that produce descendants who are both of African and German or slash French blood. And so there are lots of people today who, you know, 300 years later may self-identify as African-American who actually have ancestors that came from the German coast. And there are many uh, Black, uh, Sheck Snyders, Traegs, Heidels, in fact, the former mayor of New Orleans being my cousin and descendants. Um, one of my cousins, uh, Randall Sheck Snyder, is a, a dean at uh, Xavier University. And when he introduces himself outside of Louisiana, people are perplexed at his surname. Of course, Sheck Snyder is almost always butchered when people try to pronounce it. And of course, they look at him as a black man when he says, well, my last name is German. And they, they're really confused. So how can a black man have a German name? He, of course, explains it simply as he's German chocolate. 
So uh, thank you, Dr. Hubner. We enjoyed your, uh, your presentation. I think the audience uh, learned a lot from that. Um, also, um, one thing um, I wanted to mention as well was the, um, the petitions that uh, Fernan uh, spoke about. Uh, I really enjoyed the way you were able to link these petitions that I guess really started in the 17th century all the way up to the 21st, because as we know, the queen didn't apologize, so I think about 2003. Um, and one book that I've read, and perhaps some of you have read as well, if not, I suggest you find a copy about the Acadians is called A Great and Noble Scheme by um, John Mac Farragher. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm pronouncing the name wrong, but or Farragher, I believe he was out of Harvard, but he, um, he did a really good job of, of giving a, a history of the Acadians. And I read the book twice years ago when it first came out. And then I read it again in 2019, right before I went to the Congrès Mondial Acadien to refresh my memory. And as, as, as Fernan mentioned with the goose feather, <laughs> which he, he, he showed us uh, uh, at the beginning of his presentation, the Acadians really went back and forth. I mean, they just went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth um, um, with, the, with the French and with the British and, 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 and tried to remain neutral. And so their, their persistence uh, over all those years um, was, was really quite remarkable. And it's a pity that uh, all, all the petitions and remonstrances that were, were put forth that uh, to this day Unfortunately, we lost our, our, our fight with the, the French language, uh, to preserve our French language. I believe the religion is intact and everything else, but uh, unfortunately we lost the language because as you know, uh, each, each day you look in the obituaries, there's somebody that was a, 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 a native French speaker that, that passes away. So unfortunately, that's one of the petitions that I think, um, that, you know, they, they fought for the, the, the code of field and the bilingual education, but Unfortunately, I think at that point, it was a little bit too late to preserve our language. So I could ramble on forever and all night, but uh, I do uh, encourage people to, if they're interested in the German coast or the Acadian coast for that matter, and are interested in genealogy, uh, our historical and genealogical society does have a website, which you can, of course, Google. The initials are gachgs.com. And so uh, thank you, Marty, for inviting me to, uh, to, to chime in uh, and, and after hearing all of these very interesting papers. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, uh, Jay. I appreciate that. And I thank all three of our speakers who uh, provided a very diverse look at the German Acadian coast, not just a historical aspect as you normally see, but looking at several aspects of the uh, German Acadian coast. And thank you, Jay, for uh, your comments also. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions and I have a couple of them here that people have written in, so I'll address them if I can. Uh, the first one's to Dr. Hubner. And uh, the question was, what do you plan to do with your uh, current research that you're doing? Um, well, this, 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 this paper today was actually part of my older research, <laughs> part of my PhD project, and which I published in, in, a, in a book in Germany, in, a, in German language. So it's not yet translated into English. So um, maybe this is going to, to evolve into a paper, but it's definitely, um, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to, to do further research on, on German speaking migrants and later, of course, Germans in Louisiana. And, um, try to come up with new publications. But it's what's important for me too is, I think something I stress, and that's why I like that Jay is here on the panel is, um, it's not only about research, but also about public history and, and how we need to influence um, the people that live in these places and that, um, that visit these places. And that's why I, why I had the, the historical marker up there at, at, with the last slide. So I think that's that's something I would really like to, to see that you know this, this these sort of histories are becoming part of public history and, and you know memory and memorial practices. So that's that's I think where, where I want to go in the future. So I would be very interested in, in uh, attending the, the the celebrations uh, that you're planning for Jay at the German coast. We'll we'll, we'll see you in uh, we'll see you in Germany in September. We'll meet up for drinks. We'll make, we'll make sure. <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hubner. Um, there was a question that was asked uh, in the chat box and it was kind of answered, but I think more people would be uh, like to hear about it. And that was the uh, Evangeline statue that uh, Fernand showed. And uh, if he could discuss a little bit more about it, somebody wanted to know where it was, but I think your answer was a little more complete. If you could mention that a little bit, Fernand. It's a it's in the wonderful town of St. Martinville, Louisiana, and the, the statue of Evangeline is based on Dolores Del Rio, uh, who performed in the movie Evangeline, and she paid for and modeled for uh, that statue. And it's a wonderful little grotto alongside what I call a grotto alongside uh, the St. Martin Church, which uh, is heralded as the mother church of the Acadians, uh, founded in 1765, according to some accounts. Not to be confused with the Opelousas uh, mother church of Acadiana. Uh, they're, they're two different churches uh, that each community justifiably takes pride in having. But uh, St. Martinville, uh, is, they have the Evangeline Oak there along Bayou Tesh. Uh, but that's that's where the, I took that photograph of that statue. They also talking about the indigenous populations. They have uh, the sauvage, as the French called the uh, indigenous populations, the savage. Uh, he is at the front of the church there. Uh, anyhow, it's uh, I encourage people to visit. And thank you for the question. Thank you, Fernan. Appreciate that, Dr. Turnbull. Uh, Turnbull. There was a question about what was the relationship of the Native Americans along the German coast with the Germans and the Acadians uh, in the 1760s and 1780s. Uh, we know that they were close to the Mi'kmaq in Acadia. Was there some type of similar relationship in Louisiana? Well, that's exactly what, what the Spanish officials had hoped for, was that there would be, um, you know, a sort of uh, a quaint, uh, a smooth relationship between these Acadians and um, the native peoples around them. Um, and, and it was a, a little bit, um, you know, a little more volatile uh, perhaps than officials might have wanted. Um, for example, when the Humas build their palisade, the, uh, the local Acadians get kind of, they get nervous and upset. They're concerned that, you know, the war is impending and they start petitioning the, the governor in New Orleans and sending representatives down there um, out of concern. They want to relocate within the colony. So, um, it, it was not without its road bumps, um, but you also do see um, the prevalence through 1783 of, of what we call, um, you know, that Dan Usner sort of coined the frontier exchange economy, um, the selling, the bartering um, of goods and services across um, those groups, across uh, native um enslaved and colonial populations. And, and that really is sort of the, the key to the subsistence and the survival of that, um, that colonial zone. Um, beyond 1783, you continue to see um, sort of the remnants of that, uh, even, even as lower Louisiana, um, you know, we, we sort of see that plantation economy eventually taking off uh, and the society changing. Thank you, Dr. Turnbell. Vernon, uh... I know I've seen uh, a number of petitions when I've been in the Massachusetts archives written by the Acadians to try to wrong some of or right some of the wrongs that they've received. For example, there's a famous one, I believe, there about the, uh, the British uh, taking their children away from them and placing them with British families in Massachusetts. And the question, I guess, is, is uh, how did the Acadians of Acadia learn this art of petitioning and uh, become so successful at it? Well, that's Marty. That's a great question, and that's the unanswered question. Uh, and I think that petition is actually incorporated verbatim into Warren Perrin's 1990 petition. If if I'm thinking of the same one about the, the taking the children away, uh, and uh, not unlike what what some people are concerned about with our current border crisis, but they were being farmed out uh, as. Uh, essentially uh, uh, unpaid wage uh, or just unpaid labor uh, on top of other ills that were going on. The, uh, uh, 
Naomi Griffiths, she has some great prescient uh, concepts. She says that uh, the, she sees the handiwork of Father Lelut in some of the petitions, even after they have been uh, exiled from uh, Nova Scotia in 1755. So I, I think that if somebody can use that text analysis and, and the uh, uh, plagiarism software uh, that people are using on William Shakespeare's work uh, very successfully to determine some of the commonalities that he shares with earlier literature, not that he plagiarized, but just some of the commonalities. So the concepts of international law are contained in my reading uh, and I've put the links in there for other people. That's great reading. Uh, it's highly entertaining because the fact that the Acadians were able to hold off the British and page after page, when you turn it, the Brits are saying to their handlers back in London, to the Board of Trade, they're saying these insolent French, these, uh, uh, you know, how dare they uh, insult the king this way? It's amazing traffic of literature going back and forth. We don't have the Akkadian version. All we have are the British transcriptions, uh, allegedly. Uh, I think Jean-Francois Mouhou was able to uncover some of the petitions uh, post-exile. Uh, but Naomi Griffiths sees the hands of uh, others in those Akkadian petitions. And then also, uh, I th I th um, Peru, or Peru is the guy who had been here uh, in New Madrid uh, and up in St. Louis, I believe, and then later left the colony to go to uh, Acadie, excuse me, uh, to uh, 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 France where the Acadians had uh, settled. And he helped them with petitions over there to both to the Spanish king to get financing for them to come here as well as interceding with the French authorities to get them to come here. So. I think somebody eventually, when we bring in people with studies of rhetoric, uh, international law, uh, text uh, analysis, the coding that computers are able to do, Marty, I think we can, somebody will be able to provide further answers to that. Thank you, Bernard. Not me. <laughs> Not you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, the last question, and I'll respond to it, I think, is there's a question is that are there maps that show the location of German settlements in the parishes along the German Acadian coast. And others can chime in, but I know that Miss Merrill's book, The Germans of Louisiana, does have a couple of pretty good maps that show the German settlements along the first German coast. And uh, maybe somebody else knows of some other source that you can uh, get those. Any answers? Um, the, map, um, the map that you had, uh, Marty, I believe at the beginning, uh, I think it was on your slide. Correct. Uh, is the map that Norman? It's been recirculated, and I think it's on the cover of Ellen Merrill's book. Uh, Norman did that map in 1990, uh, based on some of the the research that was done of the four villages: Carlstein, Augsburg, Marienthal, and um, Hoffen. So uh, he put some of the plantation names and the the uh, current landmarks to kind of give people a overall. A uh, view of where the, the villages were laid out in those some of those early concessions. But once once you get from Lucy and um, between Lucy and Kelowna, the river changed its course so much that um, it's almost a complete width of the of the river has shifted. In Laplace, where Laplace is today, the river went much deeper. Where the river road veers away from the levee. Uh, that's where the Bonnet Carré, uh, the square bonnet was located and th thus the name for Bonnet Carré or Bonnie Carré as they say now. Okay, thank you, Jay, I appreciate it. We're coming to the end. Uh, I just wanted to thank all the presenters again for taking the time to uh, prepare your presentations and, uh, and uh, be here tonight to present them to us. And I'll just mention that for those that didn't get to uh, see the whole thing or have friends that didn't, It'll be on uh, YouTube in a couple of days under the Louisiana Historical Association channel on YouTube. So you can go there and rewatch it if you want or tell your friends about it. So thank everybody and uh, have a good evening tonight. And uh, to and Andreas, uh, have a good morning. <laughs> we'll uh, see all of y'all and thank you again. <laughs>